Jesus. We love to call upon your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Help me sing tonight. We love to call your name in something we cannot explain. That happens when we proclaim your great name, your great name. We love to, we love to call, call your, your name, name in something we cannot explain.
anticipating a moving of your spirit tonight, God. We're expecting you to move because your word never changes, Jesus. Your promises are true. When we call on your name, there is salvation. When we call on your name, there is healing. When we call on your name, my faith rises. When I call on your name, there is strength. When we call on the name of Jesus, there is strength. There is renewal. There is freedom. There is victory in the name of Jesus. The power of the Holy Ghost falls when we call on the name of Jesus. So we're calling on you tonight, Jesus. We're lifting up your name tonight, Jesus. It's all about you tonight, Jesus. It's not about the agenda. It's not about our worries or our fears or our stress, God. It's about you, Jesus. We're here to lift you up, Jesus. We're here to submit to you tonight, God. We're here to surrender to you tonight, Lord. Every thought we're bringing into captivity of the Holy Ghost, every emotion, every thought, because we're here to lift you up. We're here to exalt your name, Jesus. Oh, help me say the name. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Let's all put our hands together all across this house. There's a good touch of the Holy Ghost in this place. Amen. Whatever you need in this environment, it can happen. Amen. How many believe that this evening? That in this environment, if you're willing to step out by faith in the name of Jesus, call on that, that changing name, it can happen in this place. Amen. We're going to go into a season of prayer. If the elders would get ready, we do have a few prayer requests this evening. And uh, Sister Clark's um, sister was admitted to the hospital. This was a few days ago. She's doing better. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We'll take that as a victory report going forward. Amen. Also, let's remember Brother Reed. He is homesick this evening. Pray that God touches his body. I don't know of anybody else that's out sick, but I'm sure that it's still going around. Amen. But we know a God that's able to heal, able to touch. Amen. Let's remember our brothers and sisters in Vietnam. Continue to pray that God would continue the work that he's doing over there. And then also a couple weeks from tonight is the double portion conference. Let's pray that God has his way, that there's just a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'm believing God for great things in this conference, life-changing events that are going to happen every night. How many believe that God's able to do that? Amen. If you have a need in your body, if you have a financial situation, if there's sickness, whatever it is, if you'd like to stand in the gap for somebody by faith this evening, we know a God that's able to save. We invite you to come forward. If you have an unspoken request, make it known by the lifting of your hand. God sees every need. Why don't we pray this evening? Jesus, we love you. God, we praise you. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for what you're doing in Deborah's life right now. God, we're believing you for a healing, God. Oh, that you would do a work in her heart, Jesus, that you would bring peace to the family right now in the name of Jesus. God, that you would touch Brother Reed this evening, that you would touch his body, God, this sickness. God, you're able to heal, Jesus. He said, by your stripes, God, we're pleading the blood of Jesus over it. God, you see these, our brothers and sisters in Vietnam, God, the work that you've already started, God, would you continue to do it, God, to pour out your spirit. Oh, God, would you open doors and make ways, God, that only you can do. We're believing you for it, Jesus. God, you see the double portion youth conference coming up. God, we plead your blood that your anointing would be there. God, in every service, on every speaker, God, on every singer, God, on the young people that are there, God, that it would just impact this place, that it would go out from this place, God, that your will would be done, Jesus. God, in the remainder of this service, God, we need a touch from you. God, we need to hear from you this evening. God, would you touch our minds and our hearts, God, this evening. Would your will be done. We give you the praise with your voices lifted all across this place. Why do we begin to thank you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for hearing our prayers, God. Thank you for what you're doing right now, God, your unseen hand. We praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah.
not singing for us tonight. You're not singing for me tonight. You're singing for him. We're here for him tonight. Hear my heart cry, Jesus. With one voice we sing to you. So we want you, Lord. You can take the world. Just give me Jesus. Why don't we worship him? We love you, Jesus. We worship you. We give you all the glory, God. We give you all the honor. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We want you. We need you in this sanctuary tonight. We need you in our hearts and our minds this week, God, in everything that we do. Amen. Welcome to the house of the Lord on a Tuesday evening. How many of you are excited to be here tonight? We are absolutely delighted to have each of you in the house of the Lord. Thank you so much. You could be anywhere tonight. You could be home sleeping. Many of us feel like being home sleeping. But you got up and you got dressed and you made your way to the house of the Lord. Thank you so much for your faithfulness to the house of God tonight. We have just a couple of announcements. Please keep in mind, Father's Day is this Sunday, and I have heard, I don't know if this is true, I have heard that is the shortest day of the year is Father's Day. The longest day of the year is Mother's Day. Just poking fun. Father's Day is this Sunday. You do not want to miss it. Mother's Day and Father's Day is always a wonderful time at Christian Growth Center. There will be a fundraiser going on. Sunday morning, there will be breakfast burritos for sale in the foyer from 10 a.m. to 10.45 a.m. before Sunday morning service. If you're wondering what the money is for, it is for Vacation Bible School to help pay for everything going on there. 
that is going to be a wonderful time. If you want to be a part of Vacation Bible School, get in touch with Sister Mariana and Sister Juana, and they can plug you in. That is quickly approaching at the end of July. Also, Sunday morning and Sunday night, we will continue in revival with Brother Lee Wilson and wonder what a, what a wonderful time we have been having in that revival. Amen? Amen. Also, also, please remember, Saturday is men's prayer and donuts. That will begin right here in the sanctuary at 8.30 a.m. So if you are a male of any age, you are welcome to join us. If you are young enough to where you need a ride, then you probably should touch base. If you need a ride, I can bring you. Um, you can reach out to myself. But we want you here. We want you to be a part of all that God is doing. So, Men's Prayer and Donuts will be this Saturday at 8.30 a.m. Sister Carrie. You can all be seated. We're just going to do a quick presentation for our Bible quizzers. So we acknowledged them a few weeks ago when they did their final tournament. Um, but tonight we want to acknowledge each one of them for all of the work that they have done this year. They have done so much work. Um, before I acknowledge them, though, I do want to acknowledge all of our volunteers. Um, we had a small group this year, and everyone just wore whatever hat needed to be put on. And I'm just so thankful for everyone who helped. Um, Sister Pound, Sister Jess, Sister Nikki were our coaches. And Brother Pound and Sister Tina might as well have been coaches because they were there at all of our practices and our tournaments. And there were so many others who pitched in, cheering our kids on, holding my baby, um, helping out with the tournament. If you helped in any way, thank you. And if we could just give a big round of applause for everyone who helped. Thank you so much for everything that you did. So we ended up with eight total quizzers this year. Um, they memorized anywhere from 50 to 250 verses. Um, our curriculum was Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Our theme was equipped. And it was really a challenging year for curriculum um, for the verses. Uh, when you're reading the letters, they are written like letters, right? So the sentences might start in verse two and end in verse five which means verses three and four are a little strange to memorize on their own. We had a lot of places to memorize, um, long words like lasciviousness and long suffering. Some of our verses were almost identical except for one word because all the letters begin the same. They had to keep straight whether he was visiting James for 14 days or Peter for three days and whether they were in Cilicia or in Galatia or Ephesus it was a lot. So. These kids worked so hard. They practiced, they memorized, they were at quizzes, they were at tournaments. They brought home medals, they brought home trophies. They, we saw a ton of personal growth. We had new quizzers who had learned the ropes. We had more experienced quizzers who learned um, a lot about their personal quizzing, whether it was articulating their words better, learning how to win and lose better learning how to buzz in, all of those things. They all just did such a good job, and we're just really, really proud of them. So we want to acknowledge each one of them, and we're going to call them up and give them a medal for their token for the year. And this is in no particular order. Brenton Pound. <laughs> David Salas. Silas Cast. Reagan Lee. Evelyn Pound. Marcus Salas. Keelan Lee and Nolan Pound right, 
Great job, everyone. You can go ahead. And hey man, why don't we stand one more time? Probably not the last time you'll stand tonight. But why don't we all stand together? Let's give all of our Bible quizzers and coaches, and especially Sister Carrie, let's give them all a big round of applause. Amen. Quizzing is not only an enjoyable and wonderful time and teaches you many things, but the most important thing that quizzing does is it instills the Word of God into your heart. We're going to move right into tithing and offering this evening. If you would place our scripture verse upon the screen. But the land, whether ye go to possess it, is a land of hills and valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year, even unto the end of the year. If you believe that with faith in your heart, why don't you bring your tithing and your offering tonight?
Come on, do you feel that fire? That mighty burning fire? Do you feel it in this place? Got the fire! The fire! It's burning down in my soul! Come on, some of you act like you don't got it in this place. Huh? But I dare you to get your hands up uh, and ask God for the fire if you don't have it. And he will fill you uh, with the Holy Ghost and fire. your neighbors on your way back to your seat and say I got that fire and I'm ready for revival amen how many are ready to see God move in this place oh how many are ready to see God move in this place we've been in revival for a couple weeks now and I want to see what God is going to do tonight I want to see people saved. I want to see people delivered. I want to see people set free. Yes, yes. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, tonight is your night. If you haven't been baptized in Jesus' name, tonight is your night. Don't leave without being baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're ready for what God wants to say to you, why don't you lift up your hands and lift up your voice and ask God to speak to your heart as Brother Hicks comes to preach the word of the Lord. Him. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, we worship you. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. Um, doesn't really have anything to do with what I'm going to preach. But I want to remind somebody that the miraculous is the norm in the kingdom of God. Nothing is too hard for God. There is no situation that he cannot handle. There is no disease that he cannot heal. There is no financial problem that he cannot solve. There is no family problem that he cannot work out. Feel that? We can get so bogged down in our situation that we forget that we serve the all-powerful God who can do anything at any time, anywhere, in any situation. Amen? And uh, so just pick up your faith. It might be laying there in the dirt. Brush it off. Say, you know what, God? I believe you're going to work in my situation, and you're going to solve this problem in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. I give honor to Bishop in his absence. Pray that he has safe travels. Amen. And uh, honor to all the ministry in our church, great men of God that God's given us. Amen. We're going to turn in our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1. This is one of those unusual messages. prayed long and hard before bringing it to the pulpit tonight, but I believe the Lord wants to speak to somebody, help somebody in their situation. First Samuel chapter 1, and we'll start reading at verse 3, and this man, speaking of Elkanah, went up out of his city 
yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priest of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that and when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peniah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Amen. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us in the next few minutes. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive from you tonight. That you would direct my thoughts, direct my words, God. I want to please you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> um, before I launch into this, I had one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, if you do podcast at all, there's a great podcast called all things apostolic and I was listening to it yesterday and an incredible report was given about a young man that most of us know and that is Nathaniel Paul Goward and uh, interestingly named he's named after two bishops and uh, has roots here in Pueblo this young man is 12 years old I believe and a little while back, he started teaching a Zoom Bible study with some young people in Fiji. Young people, listen to me. Do not let this fly over your head. He is 12 years old. He is teaching a Bible study to people in Fiji. How many of you know where Fiji is? Adults included. <laughs> And so, somehow, a pastor in Zambia found out that Nathaniel was teaching a Bible study to people in Fiji. And so, he invited him to teach his Zoom Bible study to the youth group in Zambia. He's 12 years old, guys. He's teaching Bible studies in two countries. No pressure. Uh, and so one of the mothers joined the Bible study that he was teaching to the young people and she had recently been in a debate with the pastor about whether she needed to get baptized in Jesus name and she told the pastor that she didn't feel like it was necessary after Nathaniel's Bible study she got a hold of the pastor and said I need to be baptized in Jesus name It goes on from there. She's a teacher at a school with something like 3,000 students. She's now setting up the opportunity for Nathaniel to teach his Bible study to the entire student body via Zoom. Nothing that you are doing in the kingdom of God is insignificant. No, no act of faithfulness, no small thing that you are doing is insignificant. You never know what the Bible study you're going to teach, Silas, that's going to open a door that's going to blow your mind and blow the mind of the people around you like, what? I, I know Silas. He's just a 12-year-old kid that goes over to Christian Growth Center. So now Nathaniel Paul's been invited to go to Fiji. Okay, and we're, we're sitting here just consumed with all of our day-to-day -day stuff, 
and yet there's a young man who's decided, you know what, I'm going to do something in the kingdom of God. And uh, so, think about that, young people. There's probably a door that God wants to open for you if you'll just step through it. Amen. Praise God. So, my title tonight is Barrenness, the Mark of the Chosen. Now, that may sound a little strange to you because when we read in the scripture and a lot of cultures and societies, barrenness is not the mark of the chosen. In fact, if you study it in Scripture much, uh, barrenness was considered shameful, which is kind of bizarre in my mind because it's completely beyond your control, medically speaking. And so, but it was, uh, some of this has to do with the way that the Jews perceived bad things that happened in a person's life. So if you got sick, John chapter 9 talks about this. The apostles, the disciples at the time came to Jesus and said, Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, the, the whole idea that he could be born blind because of a sin that he committed after he was born is just bizarre to me. But it was in their minds that if something bad happened, you were blind or you were sick, or you went into bankruptcy, it was because you were a sinner. And you see that whole discussion played out in the book of Job when, when everything falls apart for Job and everybody's like, what did you do, Job? And so it was assumed that if a woman was barren, that it was because she was a sinner. And so you can imagine the... Uh, the social pressure, the, the family pressure, the, all of the things that would come to bear on these women when they had no children. And so in our text tonight, we read about one particular woman named Hannah who, who was so distraught about the situation that it actually interrupted everything else going on in her life. She couldn't even go to church. She couldn't have dinner with her family. She could not function in all of the normal functions. That's how big a deal this was to her. Uh, and, and it just began to torment her. And I'm going to come back to this again in a second. But in addition to the barrenness, she had an adversary that was provoking her. Have you ever had a bad situation going on and then you just have somebody come up and just keep jabbing you about it? And, and it, it can get really hard to deal with in a Christian manner. You just want to grab them by the throat. So you have, you have this heartache situation, and then on top of that, you have this person who's not really concerned with your situation. They're just continually wanting to goad you about it. That makes it better. And so there you are trying to navigate this difficult, barren place that, that you're in, and then along comes the devil and starts to stir up even more trouble. Uh, just a side note, everywhere that I read in the scripture where a man had more than one wife, this happened. That's real good preaching. That's a terrible idea right there. How many married men can testify that one is all you can handle? <laughs> chickens <laughs> ain't even looking right now so I 
But I began to realize that the notable women in Scripture who were noted to be barren were not sinners. They weren't bad people. They weren't out sacrificing to Baal. They weren't running around on their husbands. They were actually the first three wives of the patriarchs were all barren. Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. Now here's the thing to think about and why I picked the title that I did, Barrenness is the Mark of Chosenness, because those three women were barren, but it had already been declared by God that the seed of Abraham would bring forth the Messiah. Now when we think about the situation with Abram and Sarah, he didn't even leave Haran until he was 75 years old. And sometimes God will ask us to believe things and to walk out on promises that seem absolutely insane. Listen to me tonight, though. You may feel like you're in a Sarah situation where where it's barrenness and it seems like there is no way that what God told me would come to pass is going to come to pass because I'm 90 years old and my my husband is almost 100 years old this is crazy so I don't know what I'll do I'll come up with a solution to it your solution to your barren situation is going to be a disaster Stop. I, I, I don't know who I'm preaching to, what situation I'm talking about right now, but please, for the love of Almighty God, just stop. Whatever situation you are trying to cook, someone in this room is trying to cook up a situation to a problem right now. Stop. That's the word of the Lord. You're about to make a mess. But we're still dealing with that mess today. They are still blowing people up in the Middle East because Sarah had a great idea. She wasn't a bad person. She wasn't a sinner. She had a promise from God. It looked like a barren situation that was not going to bring forth fruit. And so she felt the pressure to come up with the solution. Then along comes Rebecca. She's also described as being barren. At least in this situation, we see in Genesis 25, 21, where her husband prayed to God and God took care of the situation. And there's a good solution if you feel like you're in a barren place, you should pray. And pray some more. And then pray some more. And then pray some more. And pray when you don't even feel like praying about that situation. When it takes all of your self-control and willpower to even open your mouth and talk to God about that situation again, pray about it again. And so Rachel also is barren, and then several other women are mentioned in the scripture. Manoah's wife, we don't even know her name. Sometimes we want out of our barren situation because we want to be known. Don't do it. Hannah has provoked a Shunammite woman in 2 Kings chapter 4 who waited on the man of God 
And, and you see in each of these situations a little bit different dynamic. The Shunammite didn't even ask. It didn't even come to her mind to bring it up. And then finally, interesting enough, the last one mentioned in the scripture is Elizabeth, the mother of John. And I, I'm not going to pretend to understand all the significance, but she's the seventh one. Seven significant women give birth to seven significant children and all of those significant children come out of barrenness. The inability to bear fruit. And if we go with the flow of what the culture was saying at the time, it's because there's something wrong with them. So what happens is when we get in these barren situations, we begin to think there's something wrong with me. I'm in this situation because I did something wrong. Everything is falling apart because I'm broken. I'm in this situation because God hates me. Or whatever the thought process is that starts to go through your head. Whatever it is that the adversary can begin to provoke in your mind, that's what begins to go on in our heads and the loop plays. Well, how do you know that? Because I've been there. I've sat there banging my head against the wall thinking, what in the world is going on? God said this, this, and this, but it looks like a dumpster fire. Is, is that too transparent? We we got to get past the point where we come to church and just look like the perfect Pentecostal family all the time. And we, we look, we want to look like our Christmas photo every Sunday. And so we sit during altar service, we sit in the back or we play with the kids because we don't want anybody to know that there's a problem going on. Instead of getting down to the place where the solution can be found and getting our face in the carpet and maybe sobbing and crying and clawing at the floor a little bit to come up. We've all been there. We have all had situations that were just beyond our control, beyond anything that we could do and yet, sitting in the back of our mind is, man, God made me some promises. And the scripture talks about barrenness. It talks about, of course, the womb, but it also talks about barren land and barren cattle. And yet, there's promises in the scripture that if the people of God will follow the commandments of God and walk in his ways and obey his commands that they will be exempted from that barrenness. And yet we find almost contradictory to what God has promised that these significant people are experiencing barrenness. This makes no sense. And that barrenness, it creates an insecurity. And so, and instead of bringing it to God, we kind of huddle up and cover it up and act like it's not there. If, if my ministry is not headed the way I think it needs to be headed, and it's not growing in the way that I feel like it needs to be growing, then instead of just bringing it to God and being open with it, I just cover up. Well, I thought there were prophecies of revival, and I thought there were prophecies of growth, and I thought there was all of these things going to happen. 
sometimes when that happens and those promises come what I can see in scripture your next stop is the wilderness it's a barren place and God's gonna find out or not God's gonna find out but God's gonna let you find out what's really in you and he will he will use situations to bring that to pass and that barrenness can also create fear and it lays seeds for doubt to rise up in our hearts and I don't know this is different uh, for us we, we obviously don't have any kids uh, we're good with that that's all I'll say about that but I know that for a lot of people not having children is an extremely difficult and painful situation and so they go through this process that that even when you just hear people talk about it you can hear the just the heartache in their voice and so uh, really what I'm preaching about tonight is not necessarily natural children but there can be a lot of things in our life a lot of promises from God a lot of of situations that we want God to work in and it's not going on our time schedule and it can begin to feel like it's never going to happen because we are not very patient particularly in modern society where if I have to wait in the drive through for more than two minutes I am losing my mind and I'm not talking about you I'm talking about me how long does it take to put the ice and the coke in the cup and send me on my way And it's been preached before, but God doesn't work out of a microwave. He's a little more like a crock pot. <laughs> Cooks all night and the whole of the next day. And I, I can remember, I was thinking about this, uh, being young in school and everybody remembers being lined up to pick teams right well I'm not particularly athletic never have been never will be but you know what I can remember multiple multiple times like every time being the last kid picked so those of you that I taught PE and you wonder why I picked the teams that's why I know it's baggage I need to get over it but I'm working my way through it, people. But there's something about that experience. You know before the first person is picked. Like, I'm going to be the last guy standing up here. 
And it's like they don't even call your name or they just turn and walk away and just kind of wave their hand like, okay, we'll take him. And so you find yourself in these situations in life, even as you're moving forward as an adult, and it looks like God's going, and you're like, hey, God, I'm over here. Pick me, God. Right? And then it's like the teams are picked, and sometimes there's an odd number of people. There's the guy who's sitting over in the corner. And I, I know we're laughing, but really, as we're laughing, there are people in this room tonight. You're dying inside feeling like God has just skipped right over you. But I come to tell you tonight, barrenness is not forsakenness. Barrenness is the mark of chosenness. Go through the process. Follow it through to the end and watch what God will do in your life. Watch what God will do in your ministry. Watch what God will do in your family. Watch what God will do when he, when he gets to the point where he's going to take action. The musicians would come. Luke chapter 18, I feel like I feel like I could have done better communicating this. But in Luke chapter 18, Jesus spake a parable unto them and of this in that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Saying, there was in a city a judge who feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. Sometimes we could deal with the barren situation if the adversary wasn't kicking us in the shins the whole time. It's like, if I just had to deal with one or the other, this wouldn't be so bad. And sometimes it's a, a lost loved one, or sometimes it's a backslider. So many situations that we can literally feel like we're out in the middle of a desert in a forsaken place. Even Jesus, when he's in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, has an adversary. And the thing is, Brother Mitchell, the Spirit drove Jesus into that wilderness. I hope I'm helping somebody tonight, but you're not in that place because you're a failure. You're not in that place because God's given up on you. It's actually the Holy Ghost that drove you into that place. And it's God who let the adversary show up while you're in that place. But just hold on. 
because it's not going to last forever. Jesus quoted the scripture three times to the adversary, and then the adversary left him. And the angels came and ministered unto him. We find the widow in Luke 18 in the parable, and she needs someone to take action for her. Her adversary is provoking her. And yet she comes and she finds that the judge is an unjust man. And for a period of time, he won't take any action, but she just keeps coming back. And Jesus said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Man. How long is this going to take? I wish I could tell you, but I can't. All I can tell you is that Jesus said that God hears you. And that he will avenge you. Verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Well, how does this long time bear long and speedily work together. I don't know. If I could explain it, if we could put it in a beaker and do a scientific test on it, or write out a calculation, Sister Lewis on the chalkboard, and solve the equation, we wouldn't need God to get involved in our situation. All I know is you may be in that situation for a while. It may go on for a little while, but the Bible promises that when he takes action, when he is ready to avenge his people, he is going to do it speedily. Amen. There's other places in the scripture where it talks about this time tomorrow. And you're thinking, this thing is 10 years in the making. Like, this is a complete mess. But this time tomorrow, you could have your solution. he speaks to these women, he speaks according to the time of life. What does that mean? The solution's done. Nine months from now, there's a baby. Think about that. When Samaria was besieged, and the man of God said to the king, this time tomorrow, and there was one Lord on whom the king leaned who said, if windows opened in heaven, would this be possible? And the word of the Lord said, you're going to see it, but you're not going to taste it. Watch your attitude as you're going through the wilderness. Watch your attitude as you're going through barren places. Watch what comes out of your mouth. I have wanted to say some things. I think this happens to everybody, but as we get older, we lose our filter.
Sometimes it's just better to... I mean, literally, if you have to physically get a hold of your face and stop the words that want to come out of your mouth because you are jeopardizing the promise that God has in your life. Do not destroy your future for 30 seconds of frustration right now as you are navigating this barren place. It's not going to be like this forever. Can we stand? A few weeks ago, I preached about 100-fold, and I had actually given Brother Pound a few pictures, and then I forgot to have him put them up. But I took some pictures while we were in Israel and then when we were in Jordan. And the contrast between the two places, they're literally on opposite sides of the same river. And yet Israel is so lush and green and fruitful. And there's fruit trees and, and olive groves and just growing everywhere. And yet when you cross over into Jordan, everything is desolate and barren and rocks. Israel has the 21st rated economy in the world with only 10 million people. Jordan, similar population, five miles apart, 126th economy in the world. When God speaks into your situation, just hold on. Just hold on. It's going to come to pass. It looks bleak right now. But God gave you a promise. And God's going to take care of your adversary. He's not going to be able to provoke you forever. God's going to step in. Can we lift our hands? Begin to worship Him. Thank you, Lord, for Your Word. I thank You for Your promise that You're going to move for Your people. God, I pray for Your people that are in barren places in their spirit right now. God, would you minister to them? Oh, would you lift up their faith? Would you strengthen their hands? In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. What's your situation tonight? What's your barren place? What's your, what's your wilderness that you're dealing with? Bring it to him. Bring it to him and say, here it is, God. I don't know what to do with it. I'm just going to bring this down to the altar again. I've brought it down to the altar 50 times, 100 times, 200 times, but I'm going to bring it again. And I'm just going to say, okay, God, here it is. I can't deal with this. I can't solve this.
just a few more moments. The Holy Ghost is ministering to people in this place. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Just reach over and pray with our neighbor. You never know the situations that your brother or your sister are going through right now over and connect with somebody and just begin to pray. Oh God, minister to your people. Oh God, touch your people. Oh God, strengthen their faith. worship him. Jesus, I love you. I honor you in this house. Oh, let the name of Jesus be exalted. Oh, wonderful Savior.
God's going to do some incredible things in this revival. Amen. And I know the, the voices that some of us have heard because I've heard them in my own mind. Oh, it's just another revival. It's just another special speaker. We've done this before. That's barrenness thinking. I'm not going to give in to it. Those thoughts may go through my mind, but they're not staying. Because I'm looking for the promise and the fulfillment of the Word of God. Amen. Praise God. Let's worship Him one more time. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, that's it. Why don't we thank Him? Thank you, Jesus, for Your Word. Thank you for Your promise, God. Thank you for what you just did in this house. God, let this spirit go with us out of this sanctuary. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, please remember youth service this Friday evening. Also revival services this Sunday morning, this Sunday evening. And all that God is going to do. God bless you. Shake someone's hand. Be friendly. Love one another. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.